Okay, so we were talking about hepatitis, and and again, it's a little one, it's a harder one to kill because it's a non-enveloped, and <clears throat> I talked about some of the clinical signs, and you know, fever and the lethargy, but anything that affects the liver can affect fluid balance because it affects protein production, and it can also affect, you know, so you can get edema, it can also affect the clotting factors because anytime the liver is inflamed for any reason, it is responsible for producing those clotting factors. So sometimes petechia or bleeding disorders are present in animals that have liver issues, this being one of them. Um, normally when we're gonna diagnose, Again, because it's a virus, they can have an overall leukopenia on their CBC. So most of the CBC will be normal. Now, let me also bring up, um, anytime, in, you know, your platelets are responsible for clotting. This disorder doesn't necessarily affect the platelets, it affects the clotting factors that help them stick together. So on a CBC, you may have normal platelets, um, but if you have abnormal clotting factors, that can affect the way your platelets function. So I, when I think clotting, I think platelets. But when something affects a clotting factor, it doesn't necessarily always affect the platelet numbers, but how does the blood clot? So that's the difference. And you can potentially see increased clotting times. Now, I don't know if you guys have talked about this in your lab class yet, and I think you talk about it in tech four, um, is when we talk about doing a clotting test, um, we do something called a PT and a PTT, which is a, a prothrombin time. Basically, when we draw blood, we have a special machine with a special test. How long does it take the blood to clot? In how many seconds? And if, they, if those seconds are prolonged, then that tells us they have abnormal clotting. And that's a separate, now most clinics can do that in-house. I mean, you know, maybe not a general practice, but like at the specialty center, you can send them to the lab, but we need to know clotting like immediately. So we have a little, it's a separate little handheld machine that holds special cartridges and we can do clotting profiles um, in-house. You can do specialized ones at the lab, but at minimum, we can do what's called a PT and a PTT and get those results um, immediately, usually within a minute or two. Um, you can actually draw a sample to isolate the virus. You can do those immunofluorescent assay testings. And then if the animal does pass away and it's evaluated on a necropsy, then you can see lesions in the liver. Sometimes endothelial, because it can attack the it can attack the endothelial lining. Sometimes that's going to be abnormal. Now for treatment, again, it's kind of our typical supportive care, IV fluids, nutritional support, probably antibiotics because secondary infections. But what we may end up having to do is if there is significant bleeding, because basically when an animal cannot clot its blood, if they have impaired clotting. What happens is every time a dog coughs, they break some blood vessels. When they bump into something, they break some blood vessels, but it doesn't cause a problem because the animal, no, their blood clots. But what happens when an animal's inability to clot is they can get these micro bleeds, but they can potentially progress into hemorrhage. Do they get a nosebleed? Are they coughing up blood? Is there any blood in the urine? Um, you get those bruises under the skin. So those are all indications. And if there is enough bleeding because they're not clotting, the animal could need a blood transfusion. The other thing is if an animal needs clotting profile or clotting factors, you can do what's called a plasma transfusion. The animal will get just plasma. So when we have a blood donor, I'm getting a little out off the topic, but it pertains to clotting. When you draw blood from an animal, it can be separated and spun down. So we draw, like if you've ever given blood, it goes into like a big bag if you've ever donated blood. It, they have very large centrifuges. And if you spin that bag, you can separate the red cells from the plasma. 
And sometimes we do what's called a packed red cell transfusion, where you're just giving them the red blood cells. Usually if they're anemic um, or if they're hypoxic and they have low red blood cells, they really just need the red blood cells. And if you have an animal that has abnormal clotting factors, sometimes we just give them the plasma, which is the liquid component of the blood, and they can get a plasma transfusion. So it just depends, and plasma will also replenish protein. So when, I, when it says blood transfusion, there's different types of transfusions, depending on did they lose enough blood from bleeding? Are we just giving them clotting? And that's not as important for this test. I'm just trying to give you that broad information and you know some things to think about. Okay, so now the big one that kind of causes a lot of problems that people have heard is parvovirus. And this one um, can cause a lot of problems. It's canine parvovirus dash two, but um, basically what parvovirus causes is hemorrhagic enteritis. So hemorrhagic is bleeding and enteritis is pertaining to the intestines. So they will bleed into their intestines and they usually have GI signs is the number one signs in parvo. Um, so originally when it was discovered in 1978, newer forms of parvo um, have come about that are more virulent. They cause more severe, well, they're easier to catch and they can cause more severe illness. I, you know, if you guys are watching the news about coronavirus that we're dealing with us, what happens is when a virus emerges, it's going to mutate and change. And it, you know, what's happening is with coronavirus now is that the coronavirus that was seen in England is now the dominant strain. And so viruses are always trying to one up us. So what's happened with Parvo is since it was first discovered, it has mutate. I mean, it's still the same basic virus. It can just change and mutate so that it infects easier or it can cause worse disease. So that's what it means. Um, it has to require rapidly dividing cells. And of course, within the intestinal lining, those are rapidly dividing cells because anytime food or feces goes through the intestine, if you guys remember from tissues and anatomy, you're always shedding some intestinal lining. Well, you always have new cells that are supposed to divide and repopulate. And so there are certain areas in the body that cells are more rapidly dividing than others. And the GI tract is one of those locations. Um, so it is ingested. It's a fecal oral uh, route. And it can stay, you know, a couple days. Then once it populates in the blood, viremia, is detectable virus in the blood. Um, then it can move into the lymphatic tissue. And through the lymphatic tissue is how it's also gonna get to the intestine. So obviously from ingesting, but also going through this process through the blood or from the GI to the lymphatics, into the blood, back to the lymphatic tissue. And typically after three to four days, the dog will start to shed the virus in its species. Um, now, typically the peak of the virus is when they start showing the very first clinical signs. Then we know the virus has kind of reached a certain viremic level, a certain level in the blood, a certain level in the tissues, um, and they stop shedding around days 8 to 12. So if you talk about four days, you're talking about a week, a week and a half of active virus and active uh, shedding. Now, part of the disease process is because the virus, it, it basically at attacks the intestinal lining. Sometimes, and, and parvo diarrhea, like I said, there's not many things in veterinary medicine that make me ill. I can handle a lot. Um, I cannot handle the smell of parvo. It will make me throw up. It has a very awful distinct smell. And I it's sometimes grayish, very watery, flecks of blood. And, you know, it's basically they're shedding some of their intestinal lining. 
And it's just a very awful, awful diarrhea. Now, let me give you guys an example. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of HGE or talked about hemorrhagic gastroenteritis in other classes. Sometimes dogs get fed like rich foods or like, you know, if a, someone gives their dog a bunch of steak and they give them a bunch of the fat. And sometimes it inflames the GI tract and the dog will have this diarrhea with a lot of blood, a lot of mucus, and that's what's called hemorrhagic gastroenteritis or HGE. And that can be after a very rich meal or something really inflamed the intestine. Parvo has blood in it. It's not, it can be hemorrhagic, but it almost has more of this gray tan off color to it. It's not just straight blood. So I will say that. Um, but what happens is because it attacks the intestine, you know, usually gram negative bacteria is what populates the intestine. And you get this, you know, penetration of that bacteria into the intestinal lining. Hold on, I think he found the bag. Hold on. Okay, so what can happen, one of the consequences to parvo that makes them feel so ill is that on top of having the virus and on top of fighting the virus, bacteria do release endotoxins. And so if GI bacteria are allowed to proliferate and then they release endotoxins, it just continues to make them feel more ill. And so it compounds the virus. Um, so a lot of times, you know, especially in a breeding kennel, in shelters, obviously anywhere puppies are, puppy mills, um, if, if one gets it, it's very hard to prevent others from getting it because it is so contagious. Um, it can be spread very, very easily. Um, there seems to be definitely, we've seen a higher parvo prevalence in Rottweilers, um, Dobermans, Springers. I mean, any dog can get parvo, but I do feel like um, when I was at Purdue, we talked about this because I was like, yeah, why do we see more Rottweilers with parvo? Well, there was a theory that in Rottweilers, remember I said a mother passes on maternal antibodies, okay? So when a mother gives the antibodies and after they nurse, and you know, we, we're, we're, what happens as the puppy gets to weeks like four and six, maternal... <laughs> Get down. I'm about to have a dog fight here. Um, maternal antibodies should start to wear off. And then you give a vaccine, and then the vaccine from week, week six to eight reestablish immunity. There was a theory in Rottweilers that the mother's antibodies lasted longer. So the problem was, even if you took your Rottweiler to get their first vaccine, if the mother's antibodies were technically blocking the first vaccine, preventing that vaccine from working. So there was a theory that is their immunity lasting longer, their passive immunity? And sometimes it was recommended to give Rottweilers a later vaccine or an extra vaccine. Um, maybe vaccinate them a little later. Now, I haven't been in general practice for quite a while. This was just what was being talked about because there was this prevalence in Rottweilers. We were, and see, I haven't seen a lot of Dobermans in practice. We see some Springers, but Rottweilers were really popular when I was in GP and kind of when I went to Purdue. Um, everybody, they were like the new dog to get. So I feel like we saw a lot of Rottweilers um, in practice, and therefore, you're potentially seeing more parvo. Um, and it can affect wild dogs. I mean, obviously, they can come into contact with the feces from an infected, domesticated dog and potentially catch it as well. And usually, they're more severe when they catch it between the six to 16 weeks, which is basically six weeks to four months old. The younger they are, the worst they're going to potentially get it. And, you know, if they're the runt 
or they have other issues, it's going to be worse. Now, the clinical signs is, you know, this bloody diarrhea. And again, the diarrhea is different because if you have a puppy with coccidia and you have a puppy with parvo, they both have diarrhea, but it's a different type of diarrhea. But like I told you guys, if you're a hospital or an ER and a, an owner calls and says, I'm bringing in my puppy, it has watery diarrhea, we always are gonna parvo test it first because it is contagious. They're not allowed in our building until we can say it's parvo negative. Um, but anorexia and then the repeated vomiting. And again, the more they have diarrhea and the more they vomit, the more dehydrated they get. And these little guys, the littler the puppy is, they don't have reserves. An adult dog has some fat to it and it has some reserves and it's a little bit hardier. But when you're a baby puppy and you don't have fat and you don't have reserves and you've not been eating, an illness is gonna hit you much harder. So they can be, um, you know, and the other thing is if you know where the litter mates are and it's affecting more than one. Now, obviously, one pup could get it and hopefully the other pups weren't exposed. But if you just got it from the breeder and then multiple puppies have it, then it's probably in their environment at the breeder. So they can be, get very depressed. They can be pyrexic, which means they have a fever and they definitely get weight loss because, and again, the smaller the puppy, you know, if they miss just a few meals, they can kind of really show that they've lost weight. Um, so we usually do a CBC and you see specifically a lymphopenia because remember lymphocytes spike viruses. You can get an, now if all of their leukocytes are low, like all of their white blood cell, that's a poorer prognosis. If their other white blood cells are good and just their lymphocytes are low, that might give them a better chance. Um, but again, a lot of times they're hypoglycemic because they're vomiting, diarrhea, not eating, and they're hypo, what does hypokalemia mean? Does anybody know what that means? So hypokalemia is low potassium. Now, anytime you have an animal that is not drinking and is vomiting, usually severe dehydration and lack of drinking, um, we can sometimes see this low potassium. Now, potassium helps. Now, you obviously we think about bones, but muscle function and neurologic function are kind of so sometimes when they're hypokalemic um, we see other issues with that um, now typically it's detected via the stool or the intestinal lining usually via the stool at the onset of the disease and within two to four days so usually from the time they show the first clinical sign it's detected now normally what we do is we do um, a commercial snap test, usually a parvo snap test. And what our policy was, there's a swab and then the lid comes with the fluid in it as I would go out to the car with gloves. You have to put it in the rectum because half the time owners hand me a bag of stool. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I need your dog's bottom because you have to put the swab and you can't now, Puppies are gonna wiggle and scream. You just have to, I, I told the owner, I'm like, he's not gonna like this. It'll be fairly short, but I need you to hold him still because I do have to put this cotton swab in his rectum. And I would put it in, kind of swirl it a couple times. And then when you put it in the plastic tube, you crack the top and you squirt the fluid in, I'd shake it up and then you put it in the snap test. It's fairly easy to do. Um, so in those tests, there's different types, uh, different types of ELISA SNAP tests. Um, so it could be IDEX, SITE, um, it just depends. But um, normally you're probably gonna do some type of fecal exam, although again, so I would keep the stool the owner gave me. Um, I would bring it in usually in like another container because I don't wanna like get it anywhere else. <clears throat> but Usually you're gonna to wanna to do another, uh, a regular fecal 
you know, because they could have other parasites, but you normally, you're not going to diagnose parvo on a fecal. You need to do a snap test. You can, via electron microscopy, sending it to the lab, you can isolate the virus in a sample. You can also um, pick it up from the tissue samples. But again, tissue samples are typically going to be done on a necropsy. So in a necropsy, you can find it in the tissues. But most clinics, I mean, I can't think of a clinic that does not have a Pargo test in the hospital because, again, it's so contagious. Um, so the treatment, you know, it really depends how severe are the symptoms. Um, Typically, so we have, let me give you two ways we treat parvo. Inpatient, hospitalizing them is ideal. But I can say parvo treatment can be $1,500 to $3,000, depending on how long the dog lives. But that's IV fluids, high dose IV strong antibiotics, potentially nutrition support, repeat CBCs, I mean, there's a lot of nursing care, IV fluids that go into, sometimes we, we would do um, an albumin transfusion. We would give them protein if they're low protein. So it's not a cheap treatment. Some owners would do what we call the outpatient option. And they would come every day to isolation. They would usually meet me in the parking lot. I'd bring the dog into isolation and we'd give sub-Q fluids. Sometimes we give a vitamin shot, like a B12 shot. We'd give them an antibiotic injection. Uh, usually we do like a little check their glucose, sometimes do like a little glucometer spot check. Um, and they would just come do that every day. And that's cheaper. I mean, it still costs money, but it's cheaper than staying in the hospital. Now, if the case is severe, we really might recommend the inpatient treatment to be more aggressive. but you know, I'm just going to be honest. Most parvo cases, I let owners know the dog has a 50 50 shot. You know, even sometimes with advanced treatment. Um, I worked with an ER doctor. He used to have a little IV cocktail in the bag of fluids. He would put vitamins and some antibiotics. And he told the owner how much to give at home every day. Now this lady's dog survived, like she called us and she's like, oh my God, that worked so well. Um, but sometimes it's good nursing care is going to make the difference because basically the body has to fight parvo. We don't have an antiviral against parvo. So that's what the antibiotics and the fluids and the nutrition, these dogs really can't have anything per os or by mouth because they're vomiting and it's going right through the GI tract. So most of our treatments with medications have to be intravenous because they can't handle oral antibiotics. They just throw them up. And the problem is doing that at home with an owner is challenging. Um, so you can do IV fluids and dextrose in the fluids, but I'm sure you've been told this, but wait, you've not had tech four. Have you, you've not had tech four, right? Have you? Where you did fluids, EKGs, so you haven't done tech four. Okay, so you haven't talked about fluids. The only thing I wanna tell you about fluids is you can give fluid sub-Q. If they contain dextrose, you cannot give fluid sub-Q. You cannot give dextrose sub Q, it will cause tissue sloughing. And that's huge because if you accidentally give textrose sub Q, the dog is going to form potentially a big open wound on its back. And you don't want to explain to a client, oh, sorry, I gave your dog sugar sub Q. Um, it's, it's, it's hypertonic and it draws fluid and it will cause necrosis of the skin. So you need to burn this into your brain. And that's why I'm saying it now. I'm sure you're gonna hear it in your tech four class. If you have sugar in a bag of fluids, it can only go intravenous. It cannot go sub-Q. So if we give sub-Q fluids, we are literally just giving 
the IV fluids and they have electrolytes in them. Sometimes we even add like extra potassium because if they're hypokalemic, sometimes they need more potassium than what's in the bag. Um, and then if you can get them to 12 to 24 hours of no vomiting, we're usually gonna try to start them on a bland diet, like a little bit of ID uh, in test prescription diet is ID. I think at the school you guys use EN maybe. It's whatever's the bland diet that your hospital, you know, Royal Canaan makes a, a hospital bland diet. Prescription diet is what I'm used to using is ID. Um, and usually we're going to give them antiemetics like Serenia. So if you've never, you know, if you've heard of Serenia, Serenia is a once a day sub Q antiemetic. They usually will not vomit when you give them Serenia. It's pretty powerful. It has a tablet form, but remember, if a parvo dog is vomiting, we don't usually want to give them tablet medication. So we usually give them sub Q Serenia, sub Q fluids. And then whenever you start a bland diet, and I've always been tempted in the hospital, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to give you guys lots of tips, lots of clinical tips. Um, you don't want to go too fast with the ID because I've had sometimes these little puppies gobble up that meatball and you're tempted to be like, oh, look, he's eating. He's really hungry. Let me give him a few more meatballs. They will overdo it and then we'll get them vomiting again. And you have to start from scratch and wait another 24 hours. And so I usually give them as sad as they look and they give me the eyes like, why did you just give me one little meatball? I'm like, you'll get more if you keep that down for an hour, then I give you another meatball. And if you keep that down for an hour, I'll give you two meatballs. You go really, really slow because their stomach's been empty and they've been very sick. So you gotta go really slow with that bland diet. Hopefully they've got some uh, Serenia on board. And then the best disinfectant, Parvo is extremely hardy. I, you know, it can live up into the, in the environment for about six months. That's why at school, we don't have you walk on one side of the building because we wanna keep an area to walk Parvo dogs because we don't wanna take good dogs. I, I, to be honest, I'm trying to think if we've even had any Parvo dogs at school. But you know, six months to a year, it can live in the soil. So not that you wanna necessarily bleach your grass, but um, it is pretty hardy. Um, and bleach is the main disinfectant that we use. And that's, you know, so you can use a one to 30 dilution of your 5% bleach is going to kill uh, parvo. Do you have questions about parvo? Or maybe you've talked about, like I said, some of this. Um, normally your clinic is gonna have a protocol a parvo protocol, an isolation protocol that will have defined rules um, and kind of like a, an SOP, standard operating procedure of what we do when we have a parvo case. So, and again, it is sad. I feel bad too for owners that hospitalize and really put the money in because like I said, even with in-hospital treatment, we have had dogs that have passed away because the virus was too strong. You're basically supporting the body with as much good stuff to help the body fight the virus. Uh, you know, but when they're vomiting, diarrhea, hypokalemic, um, pyrexic, their body is in no shape to fight a virus. And now we don't typically use anti-inflammatories. Again, if you use anti, you need the inflammatory process to help kill a virus. So if we suppress immunity, we worry about suppressing it too much and we would cause a problem. Okay. Um, so are there any questions from that? 